Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. Good evening and, and welcome. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council. Uh, before we plunge uh, into tonight's program, I just want to say a couple quick words about uh, the uh, uh, few remaining events that we have uh, for 2019. Um, as you uh, all know, this has been an exciting and important year for the council, our 70th anniversary year. Um, and we're not, we're, not, we're not done yet. We're going to squeeze in a few more before the end. Uh, so up next, uh, a week from uh, tonight, uh, on December 2nd, we will welcome uh, Samantha Power, the 28th U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, we're going to hold this program at Girard College, and uh, the ambassador will, among other things, be discussing her book, The Education of an Idealist. Uh, and then to close uh, our programming for 2019, uh, we are going to partner uh, with both the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and Independence Blue Cross uh, for a panel discussion uh, on uh, healthcare uh, in an aging society, uh, a program uh, we're calling the Silver Tsunami. Uh, we have many uh, exciting programs in the works uh, for 2020, uh, beginning uh, right uh, uh, sort of off the, off the block uh, in January. So please uh, watch our website uh, for those uh, announcements. Uh, with that, uh, on to our program for this evening. As you know, our guest this evening, uh, Dr. David uh, Shulkin, was appointed uh, by President Trump as the ninth United States Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Uh, served in that role from February of 2017 until March of 2018. Uh, Dr. Shulkin also served as Under Secretary of Veterans Affairs for Health uh, under President uh, Barack Obama. Uh, under Secretary Shulkin's leadership, the Department of Veterans Affairs streamlined the appeals process for veterans seeking disability benefits, made wait times more transparent, and improved mental health services. Uh, before his time in government, uh, Dr. Shulkin had a long career uh, in healthcare leadership and management, including at the University of Pennsylvania Health System, now Penn Medicine, uh, as well as Temple University Hospital, Beth Israel Medical Center, and the Morristown Medical Center. Uh, so Dr. Shulkin is gonna make some opening remarks, uh, after which he and I will sit in conversation for a bit, and then of course we'll conclude with some questions uh, from all of you. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. David Shulkin. Well, um, thank you so much for, for coming out tonight. I appreciate that. And Craig, thank you for the World Affairs Council hosting me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, as all of you know, I, I live in Philadelphia, and so it's always good to uh, talk to a hometown crowd. Um, later on, I think uh, after you sit through all this, you're going to get a chance to get a copy of the book. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. The reason I wrote the book was really for two reasons. One is, is that as a private citizen, I always felt that our veterans, if there's any group of Americans who deserve the very best that this country could give, that it was our veterans. And uh, I, like many of you, read about the care that was being delivered and just thought we could do better. And the second reason I wrote the book is something a little bit more temporally relevant, and that is, is the environment that we see today in Washington, particularly for public service, has become so toxic and so unbearable for many public servants that we're seeing people leave the federal government. We're seeing people who normally would have chosen to come in to help serve in government, not making those decisions. And I think that ultimately ends up hurting all of us. So I wanted this book to be constructive, to be able to address both those issues of care for veterans, but also have us as all of us as citizens think about the type of environment that we see in Washington. Uh, so let me go back to the very beginning and I'm just gonna make some, some general comments that will take you through this quickly and hopefully Craig help you in thinking through what you wanna talk about. Um, <clears throat> When, uh, when I was first approached by President Obama about coming to help uh, improve the VA, uh, I started a 12-month vetting process. You don't see that today. The vetting process, as President Trump says, is he doesn't believe in it. He lets the media do it. But uh, at the time with President Obama, it was a 12-month process that was pretty extensive. And so when the president called me and asked me to come, I was a CEO of a hospital and I probably did what most of you do when you're faced with the choice. I took a blank sheet of paper. I drew a line down the middle. I had a pros side and a con side, and quickly the con side filled up. I was going to 
leave my job. It was a lot less money. I was going to have to move to Washington, reputational risks. I didn't even know at the time it was possible to be fired by tweet, else I would have added that to the list. Uh, and on the pro side, it was because I really felt a sense of responsibility. I felt like I could help and this was the right thing to do. And so I stopped thinking about things and I just decided I'm going to do this. Uh, during the vetting process, um, it's pretty extensive. They take a look at every publication you've ever written, every talk you've ever given, every trip you've taken out of the far out of the country since age 18. Um, and then one day, um, my wife, Merle, who's here over there, was in our local supermarket in the dairy aisle, and a neighbor came up to her and said, uh, is everything okay with your husband? And she said, yeah, why? And she said, well, because I just had a bunch of FBI agents at my door wanting to talk for an hour about your husband. Um, so finally, I got through the vetting process. The White House called me and said, looks like everything's good. We think you better tell your employer, because I wasn't allowed to tell him before I would be officially nominated it's time to leave your job. So I went to my boss, I quit my job. An hour later, the White House called me and said, I think we're a little bit optimistic. Uh, it doesn't look like it's gonna happen. You have some holds by senators. And um, I didn't understand what a hold was, but apparently any US senator can just place a hold on you. Nothing necessarily to do with you, but maybe more political favors that they want. And uh, the process stops. So. Um, Right before July 4th of uh, recess of 2015, um, the White House said, we think we've cleared the holds and they were going to the floor to vote on my nomination. And Senator Sullivan from Alaska put a final hold on me. And uh, he said, but I think I can clear this up if I speak to the nominee. So he called me from the Senate floor and said, look, I'm from Alaska. Veterans there are different. We're not like the rest of the other states. Uh, if you promise that you'll come with me within 30 days after being confirmed to Alaska and tour the state with me to meet the veterans, I'll vote for you. And so I said, Senator, we're going to Alaska and got voted and went into government. Um, now, when I, uh, when I entered government, the big issue facing VA was the wait times. We had all been reading about veterans not being able to get the care they needed. Turned out there were hundreds of thousands of veterans waiting for health care more than 30 days, uh, some of them potentially being harmed and even dying because of that wait. So I came in with a clear mandate. And what I did was I did what's called a stand down. It's a military term where you focus on an issue and that becomes your priority. And over the course of a weekend, we got every veteran uh, in the country who had urgent issues seen by keeping every VA medical center open till we cleared the lists of all of our urgent veterans. We then put same day services in place. So today you would have same day services in every VA medical center across the country. And then finally, I published all of our wait times publicly. Still the VA is the only healthcare system in the country that posts its wait times for everybody to see. Last year, I published a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association that compared VA wait times now to the private sector, what all of us get in the private sector. And VA wait times are actually statistically better than what you find in the private sector, sometimes dramatically. Um, and during the course that I was there, you could see the wait times came down, where in the private sector, the wait times have stayed about the same over the last couple of years. So hopefully that's better. Now, when I entered VA, I actually came from the private sector, knew nothing about government, and I had an open mind that maybe I'd come in and find that the system was so bureaucratic, so um, dysfunctional, that the best thing to do would be to close it down. I, I, I simply didn't know what I, was fine, what I would find, but I was, was certainly open to that being one of the possibilities. So one of the first things I did was, was um, I'm very influenced by the TV shows I watch. So one of my favorite TV shows is Undercover Boss. I put on my white coat, my stethoscope, and I started seeing veterans in the VA medical centers. And my first patient that I saw in the Manhattan VA in New York City was a 24-year-old who came to see me. And he had been discharged from the Army about six months earlier. And I couldn't really figure out why he was there to see me. Usually 24-year-olds don't come to see internists with the type of very sort of minor complaints he had. So I finally said to him, look, what, why, why are you here? You know, this doesn't make sense to me. And he said, well, I've been living in Central Park for the last six months. I got discharged from the army. They provided me a place to stay, gave me food every day, told me what to do. 
but I don't know what to do. And so I ended up in Central Park and now I'm homeless. Well, the VA knows exactly what to do when there are homeless veterans. And we have programs for that. So we found them temporary housing, then permanent housing, vocational help, and got him back on track the way that he should be. And I soon began to understand that the VA system does things very different than the private sector. You can't just close the system down and expect that we're gonna have these veterans get the type of services and care they need in the private sector. Because when I was a private doctor or a private CEO, I wouldn't have known how to deal with a homeless veteran, I would have said, well, you know, go find a social service agency to help you. Uh, so that really reinforced that this is an important system. And so we started to do some really good things in, in my time when I, in the Obama administration. We essentially addressed hepatitis and eliminated hepatitis from the veteran population, hepatitis C, across the entire country. We expanded telehealth dramatically. We gave, using federal supremacy, advanced practice nurses, the ability to see veterans across the country and to allow pharmacists to work at the top of their license. And things were going really well. Before I knew it, 18 months was up. That was the 18 months I had in the Obama administration. The election was happening in November of 2016. Of course, we know the results of the election. And a couple of weeks after the election, the Trump landing team arrived at VA. That's the team that comes before inauguration to plan what this transition should be like and what the new plans will be. And the first thing that the Trump uh, landing team said is, we will not talk to any Obama appointees. We don't really want to hear from you. We don't want to hear what you were doing because we don't care. Um, we have our own plan in place. And so as the undersecretary running the VA healthcare system, even the secretary, we had no interaction with the landing team of any substance. Um, the election, uh, the inauguration is January 20th. Uh, I find myself um, in January of 2017 uh, packing my, my, backs my, packing my boxes. Uh, I had submitted my letter of resignation and I was ready to go like all the political appointees in the Trump administration. And then there was a press conference on January 11th of 2017. I had been getting dressed in the morning, happened to turn on the TV, and I heard there would be a press conference where the president-elect would be announcing the new secretary of the VA. And I thought that would be interesting to see who, who, the, who the person's going to be, because this matters a lot to me. And uh, I watched that press uh, conference on, uh, at 11 a.m. on January 11th, and the president after about 15 minutes of the conference, pulled out an envelope. It was like the Oscars where he was fumbling the envelope. He finally opened it. He said, the new secretary of the VA is going to be David Shulkin. And I was like, okay, did he just say that? Uh, but, but, you know, this was all us getting used to a president who does things very differently than what we had expected and certainly than past presidents. Uh, but I was sworn in. Uh, I was sworn in by the U.S. Senate 100 to 0, the only one in the Trump cabinet that had 100 uh, uh, senators vote for them, and it was a bipartisan, and that's the way I wanted it. And my swearing in, I had Republican leadership and Democratic leadership, which was exactly the way I felt things should be for veterans uh, done in a bipartisan way. And the early times in the Trump administration, particularly my first year, was a very productive year. Um, it was very different than the Obama administration. It was much looser. Um, there weren't as many rules. And I was able, since I knew what we needed to do to fix the VA, I had a plan, a formula that was working. I would go into the president. And I would say, we have to do these things. And he would say, is this good for veterans? And I would say, yes. And he'd say, so then let's do it. And so that first year, we got 11 bills through Congress, all with bipartisan support. As Craig said, we did the appeals uh, modernization. We did the accountability bill. We made choice a permanent part of the way that veterans get health care. We expanded telehealth. We expanded mental health benefits. We gave benefits to those that were other than honorably discharged, which had never been done before. Um, and we did a new GI bill for veterans so that they could get expanded benefits. So things were going very, very well. Um, and all this was strengthening the VA and modernizing the VA, something I believe strongly on. And I spoke against privatization. I didn't think it was a good idea for us to dismantle the VA healthcare system or the VA system in general. Uh, most importantly, I felt that way because veterans didn't want it. I would speak on a regular basis to our veterans groups and talk to them about what they wanted. And they wanted a strong, sustainable VA. And that's why I stood up for it. 
But the politics eventually caught up with me in the administration, where there were a number of political appointees who didn't feel that way. They felt that the system shouldn't be run by the government, that this should be a privatized system. And so they started to do political gamesmanship in Washington, which included leaking information and using misinformation. And ultimately, that led to the president firing me by tweet. Uh, again, much to my surprise, sort of fitting the way I learned about it and the way I left uh, without a lot of warning. Um, there's an unwritten rule that when that happens to you in Washington, you should go away quietly. Just just go back into wherever you came from and don't say anything. But, you know, I never signed up for that. I only came because I believe that it was important to fix the system for veterans. So that night that I was fired by tweet, I sat down, I wrote an editorial to the New York Times that basically said the reason why this is happening is because I would not go along with the privatization of VA. And I stood up and I said that. And, um, you know, I think that um, that that was uh, part of the principle that I believed in in speaking out when you see things that that aren't going that right. Um, the relevance to today is, is that you're seeing this exact thing happen time and time again. You're seeing dedicated public servants, uh, many who have been on TV in the last couple of weeks, who are focused on things that they believe in, principles that they believe in, outside interference with essentially what their jobs are, making it difficult, and they're standing up and talking about the principles that they believe in. And I'm certainly proud of those people that are willing to do that. Uh, so as you read the book, you'll see the title, It Shouldn't Be This Hard to Serve Your Country, has a double meaning. It's really about veterans, for veterans, who I believe once they have raised their hands to put their life on the line for the country, when they come back, if they need our help, it shouldn't be that hard. They shouldn't be meeting the bureaucracy. They shouldn't be having to fight their government for the benefits they deserve. But the second meaning has to do with public service and that it really is an environment today that is increasingly difficult with the divide that we see in the country, the focus on personal attacks on people. I think it's completely inappropriate and doesn't work to the advantage of us having the best function in government. So I hope that we can have a reset in Washington and really think about trying to um, create an environment that makes sense for everybody. So I'll stop there and uh, be glad to, uh, or I guess I'll join you for yes, some. Thank you very much. Um, so most people, I think, have not yet had the chance to read the book. They will. Um, you, uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is unfinished agenda, the things you would have liked to have been able to do. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, for, first of all, um, I think that there nothing happens that quickly in Washington. So there are many, many things that I was working on that I felt were important to be able to complete to be able to transform the VA from where it is. And that was really the primary reason why I wrote the book. When you leave government, you would think maybe people are going to reach out to you and say, hey, what were you working on? What was the unfinished business? Who were the people in Washington that was helpful to you? But that doesn't happen. You know, um, so there was no communication. And so this book for me is a way of me putting down that unfinished business. Um, I think that there are a number of things. I just started to work on the benefits issue, which wasn't natural to me because I'm a physician and healthcare leader, but I believe it's one of the biggest injustices that we have today. We have veterans from the Vietnam era who were exposed to Agent Orange who today are still not getting the benefits and the services that they deserve because of bureaucracy and the inability to put the evidence in a way that it makes sense to government bureaucrats. We have Gulf War veterans exposed in burn pits who are fighting the same fight that their Vietnam veterans uh, had to go through. And frankly, I think we have our system backwards where uh, the people who are exposed to these types of exposures should be given the benefit of the doubt and their country should stand behind them. And it's only if we prove that there wasn't an association should we then start adjusting the benefits. So that was certainly one thing. 
Second thing is this balance of when veterans go out to the private sector, when they stay in the VA system, I think is one of the most critical issues that will determine whether it is a future VA for decades to come. And by the way, I believe having a strong VA is a national security issue. If you have a voluntary military, less than 1% of Americans now serve in the military, and the people who volunteer that we rely on to defend this country don't believe they're going to have somebody standing behind them when they come back and they need services. Who's going to volunteer? And so, so um, I believe that it is important that we get the balance between the private sector and the VA working well together. I've been very critical of the administration's decision on this. They chose a arbitrary administrative standard, which is how many minutes you have to drive to a VA or how many days you have to wait for an appointment as the way of determining who gets care where. And I believe a healthcare system should be based on clinical criteria, what's best for the individual patient, where can they get the best care that's going to help them. And so they've gone in a very different direction than I would have gone as secretary. And so to me, that's unfinished business. And then there are a number of reforms, just, you know, there are 43,000 vacancies in the VA today. And that's because we have a system that doesn't work in being able to hire people that in a competitive way with the private sector and being able to pay them in a competitive way with the private sector. So that needs to be done. Thank you. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time and it, it is our sort of custom at the council to play devil's advocate on some of these things. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on this issue about privatization. Um, and also on the question of uh, something that I think is increasingly in the news uh, across all of uh, all of the departments, and that's the relationship between uh, the the policy of the president and and the uh, uh, ideas and values of those who are charged to to carry out that in the executive branch. Let me start on the on the policy question. So uh, there are you've described people working in a kind of a shadowy way uh, to undermine uh, your role as secretary because you didn't agree uh, and wouldn't come out in favor of privatization. But if we take that, if we take sort of the personal out of, uh, out aspect out of it and talk about uh, the policy, um, is it not a, a sort of a reasonable ideological position to say, uh, we all, we all uh, appreciate veterans very much and we all want them to have great health care. Uh, but it may be uh, that having that provided in government-owned, government-operated facilities uh, is not uh, the best way. Uh, for example, we look at the, uh, the Indian Health Service, uh, where there's been you know, a series of scandals and, and people reported uh, to have died as a result of treatment from doctors who had, uh, who, who had their licenses revoked in the past and so on. There are lots of people in this room who think that the, that going to the DMV, right, and having to go to the DMV and having that be a monopoly of the government uh, is, uh, is a horrible experience. But we're sort of requiring uh, veterans to participate in a state monopoly system. So isn't it a reasonable position to explore privatization? Of course it's reasonable. And, and in fact, that's what I said. When I entered government without any real experience in this, I was exactly where you are, which is saying, look, if I find that this system is doing what the private sector is doing, only worse, more inefficient, and a lower quality. The only decision I think I would make would be, let's figure out a way to transition the government out of this business over to the private sector. What I had been doing the last 25 years of my career, running private sector hospitals. But what I found is what the VA does is very different than the private sector. And probably the example that I think most people would understand, particularly if they've had experience with this in the private sector, is behavioral health care. Behavioral health care in the private sector is broken. Even if you have enough money to pay cash on the barrel, good luck finding the health care that you need in behavioral health care. But those that don't have the ability to put out three, four hundred dollars an hour, our veterans in the VA system largely are a safety net population, an underserved population. Just throw them out with the Medicaid patients, and then you're going to see a lot more trouble with veterans, more homeless veterans, more veterans with suicide, even though these are significant problems now. 
So I came to the conclusion that we need a strong VA system. Now, when I first joined the VA in 2015, we were sending 19% of our patients out to the private sector. When I left, we were sending 36% out. So I believe the right answer for the veteran, if you put them in the center, only what's best for them, was having a VA that was strong in certain things that the private sector didn't do well and sending the veteran into the private sector on things that frankly the VA or government services didn't do well. And again, the example I use, even though it's a dumb example, is eyeglasses, right? The VA makes eyeglasses for veterans. They make them in one color, they're black. It takes three weeks to make them and it takes a veteran three visits to get them. Well, every shopping mall in America makes a good supply of eyeglasses in one hour. So why should the government be in that business? It doesn't serve veterans well and, and there's nothing particularly unique about making eyeglasses. So, so I was designing a system that was actually trying to get the veteran to the place that made most sense for them. But that includes a VA that's strong. I think a lot of people who are arguing that government shouldn't be delivering services were doing it from an ideologic point of view. Um, one that I respected, I just didn't agree with. As a healthcare professional, that was best for veterans. So it, it's, it's the description of you as a sort of categorically opposed to privatization is, is fake news, right? Totally, totally. Look, in Washington, my experience was I usually ended up somewhere in the middle, okay, um, where, where, you know, I believe that this best solution was a private public partnership. The people who do best in Washington, they live at the political fringes. It's an easy so soundbite. Either government has no role in providing services, let's get completely out of it, or on the left, government only should be involved in this. This is no role for people who should be able to make money off of veterans. And if you're in the middle, people don't understand it and they don't care that much. So let's talk about the other aspect of, 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 uh, of, of uh, what I sort of introduced, which is there's a lot of discussion now about the relationship between uh, federal employees, whether they're civil service or they're political. Uh, and and the presidency. This 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 debate. We had a we actually had a program on this just a couple nights ago at Congress Hall um, about the the theory of the unitary executive, that all power uh, in the um, uh, in the executive branch of the, of the United States relies in the president. Everyone works for the president and and simply needs to do what the president tells them unless it's unlawful, in which case they should resign. Um, so uh, in, to the extent that, that you were uh, opposing a, a policy initiative of the president, was it your responsibility to resign? Well, uh, first of all, um, I do think that the way that our system works is, is that particularly as a member of the cabinet, I served at the president's pleasure. And now we're seeing the 18th person leave the cabinet. So he believes in that too, you know, I mean, you know, uh, so I knew every day could be my last day. And if that was the case, I'd be okay with that. Uh, and so I looked at every day that I had as a privilege to be able to do the work that I thought I believed in, but if it would end, I never thought it would be permanent. Um, I always thought that, um, my job was to give the president the advice that I thought that was the right thing for veterans. Uh, and answer any questions and certainly listen to what his perspective is. But I was not going to violate principles that I believed in. And, um, you know, one of those examples was I happened to be with the president on the day that Charlottesville happened. We were together at his Bedminster Club in New Jersey. And, um, you know, I watched as he talked about this issue over the next couple of days. And I obviously wasn't comfortable uh, not speaking out against some of the things that he said. I felt that as an American and, and certainly knowing that veterans had been killed and put their lives on the line against the principles that the Nazis and the white supremacists held and feeling strongly that every American should be speaking out against that, I went to the press and I said, look, I'm a member of the cabinet. I think we have to speak out against the white supremacists and the neo-Nazis. And I told my family, I'm probably going to get fired for this, and I'd be okay with that. 
Now, unfortunately, uh, probably fortunately, he wasn't watching TV at that time. So, you know, I didn't get fired that day. But but um, but, you know, I think just as we're seeing on TV right now with the impeachment trials, every civil servant or political appointee has to know what they stand for, has to stand up for that, has to be willing to put their job on the line. But it's not their job to go against the president. They speak out. And if they can't, if they don't feel they can work for the administration, they either have to quit or be fired. In terms of the, you, you've described sort of a, a, a range of activities that the, that the VA provides. Uh, there's the, the focus that people talk about the most seems to be the, act, the clinical health care services. Um, but as you say, it is a social service agency, it is a mental health agency, and so on. How would, what do you think the, 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 that proper balance is? Where, is? where is the real priority in what the government must provide? Yeah. Well, uh, people don't understand the the extent of the Department of Veteran Affairs that's now the second largest agency in government, uh, only uh, smaller than the Department of Defense, but VA would have 375,000 people, the D State Department would have 20,000 people, and now probably less, my understanding is. But so, I mean, this is a massive organization that actually has a much wider scope than it gets credit for. The two programs that I believe have had the most significant impact on veterans and on Americans in general were essentially the GI Bill and the, and the VA Home Loan Program. They help people, millions of veterans, get their first homes and get education that has gone on to contribute to American society in many different ways. The healthcare part of the organization gets so much attention because um, it's been so problematic. Um, every veteran, if they choose, gets to be buried in a, in a VA cemetery. Uh, you don't hear a lot about that because they do a spectacular job of honoring veterans at that time of their life. The benefits generally has worked fairly well, except for some areas that it, it's clear that it's not working. Uh, but healthcare has struggled uh, in many, many different ways, why it gets so much attention. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's natural to focus on areas that, that where the services have been lacking. Um, but um, I don't think that healthcare is any more important than the other parts of VA. Let's talk about uh, two of the, of the problems of veterans that, um, that people hear somewhat about, but probably not enough. One is the issue of, of homeless veterans. Uh, certainly, uh, every major city in the United States hosts a population of, of homeless veterans. What do you think the sources are of that? What more do you think can be done about that? Uh, so in 2009, President Obama stated the goal is to end veteran homelessness. And the VA and lots of local community groups have been working hard to do that. They've gotten halfway there. So we have a 50% reduction in veteran homelessness, but there's still 45,000 homeless veterans. And while there are lots of reasons why um, there are so many homeless veterans, um, if you look at some of the core reasons, and I've gone out and walked the streets of Los Angeles and Washington at 1 a.m. finding homeless veterans and, you know, finding out some of their needs, you often find that a lot of these people, not surprisingly, have behavioral health care issues. A lot have substance abuse issues. And why aren't they getting the care that they need? Well, one of the reasons is, and people may not know this, that there are 250,000 people today that are discharged from the military every year that go back into civilian life. 15% of those are discharged with other than honorable discharges. When you're discharged with an other than honorable discharge, you do not get benefits. You don't get any support, health care, financial benefits, behavioral health care. So that's 40,000 veterans every year going out there with no support. And often, they are the ones that are suffering from PTSD and issues related directly to their conflict, to, to their time in service. They did something like they yelled at, a, at a, um, you know, somebody above their command, or maybe they got into a fight, and now they get this other than honorable discharge. And that's why it's one of the things I did was I made sure that other than honorable discharges uh, have access to behavioral health care services, because I think it is related to our suicide issue and to homelessness. 
And I wanted to go next to the to the suicide issue. Uh, those uh, the statistics are are, are shocking. Um, what more can be done? Twenty veterans a day take their life uh, from suicide, which is a staggering number, an alarming number. Uh, and while suicide is a public health care crisis in general, uh, veterans have about double the rate. If you take a look at where the single highest incidence, the percent. Uh, incidence of suicide. It's in the one year period from discharge back into civilian life. So again, and you know, I have to give President Trump credit for this. Uh, when I approached him and I said, I want to provide every person leaving the military with a year's benefit of mental health services, he was supportive of that. So today, every veteran will have access to behavioral health care services. Before we did that, only 40% of them did. Uh, so that's one issue. The second issue is, is that of the 20 veterans who take their life every day, only six are getting care in the VA system. So there are 14 in the community. My concern is, is that they may not be getting any access to services at all. So the VA needs to work with its community partners. It needs to work with veteran service groups. It needs to work with local and state government. It needs to work with churches and synagogues, and it needs to work with uh, social service agencies, all to be aware of looking for veterans who are at risk, identifying ways to help, getting them into VA care if that's necessary, or getting them into private sector help as long as they get help. So this is community by community that um, the efforts are beginning to really try to address this issue. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the uh, increased percentage of combat injuries uh, in the in the post 9/11 wars, that because of improvements in battlefield medicine, uh, more of more injuries don't result in death. The death rates are lower, but we have uh, a large number of folks with physical disabilities, lifetime physical disabilities. Um, what is in place to uh, to assist those folks who are going to need long term attention? Uh, and is that is that transition really has it really been recognized in the in the veterans health system? Yeah, I think I think the VA was very uh, slow to initially recognize the type of injuries that were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And so when people look at why the wait time crisis happened in 2014, it actually had begun to happen really almost a decade before and was just building up. And the wait time crisis itself was not just due to the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, but it was a perfect storm of Vietnam veterans now entering age 70 on average, having greater demands on healthcare services. So you had both groups hitting the VA at the same time. Both, I think it was unprepared for. Uh, in terms of these types of new injuries, I think the VA has now caught up with that. Uh, they have developed centers of excellence for prosthetics, orthotics, rehabilitation. The research that the VA does, uh, something else that people forget about, the VA was the first to develop uh, hemodialysis, the cardiac defibrillator, the first lung transplant in the country, the CAT scanner, all sorts of advances that Americans rely upon. The VA also does unbelievable research in prosthetics and orthotics and in getting people back to normal functioning life where they can. Uh, and I think that they're doing a better job at that now. And there's still some areas that it needs to improve in. But um, one of the lessons is, is that I don't think we can um, send people off to conflict without thinking about preparing for when they're coming back. And I think these two processes have been disjointed. The decision to send people off into harm's way and the decision to prepare for them coming back have been way too disconnected, in my opinion. How uh, how did you deal with the politics of the of the veterans community? Um, clearly, there are there are different veterans groups, mm -hmm. um, whether geographically, uh, by conflict, uh, by age. Um, did you find a sort of a, a coherent uh, set of requests coming to you, or were there, or or, or were you dealing with uh, a variety of special interests, essentially? Yeah. Um, I was the first secretary who was not a veteran. And I took that responsibility very seriously in that that required 
that I reach out and be much closer to the veteran community. And so I looked at the veteran service organizations like American Legion, VFW, Disabled American Veterans. There are six big ones and hundreds of smaller ones. Uh, I took that relationship very seriously where I would consult with them and listen to them as if they were my customers uh, in a way that I thought I really needed to. And they were great help in that and in, in advocating for veterans, and I took their advice very seriously. They also had their ear to the ground politically by walking the halls of Congress in a way that I just couldn't. And so they were a great help in telling me about things that were important that I consider. And when I would find that I would jump ahead of them, I was usually sorry because, because they would slap me pretty hard and they were usually right about these issues. Um, so, so uh, you know, interestingly, uh, sometimes the administration, both the Obama and the Trump administration, saw them as being stuck in the status quo, that, 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 that they were against reforming and uh, evolving the VA system. I didn't find that. I just felt that probably people hadn't approached them in the right way and made them a partner. So I think I had very strong relationships with the VSOs, and I, I always felt that that was an important part of my job. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there are lots more questions about veterans and veterans affairs, which we can turn to the audience just momentarily. But while we have you here um, as a uh, as a as a national figure and a former uh, member of the Trump cabinet, uh, what where do you stand on the impeachment process? What do you think the right answer is here? Well, I, I I'm very uh, sad to see the country going through this. I I, I see what's happening now as uh, something that we got forced into so that it has to be pursued, but I think it's all attention being taken away from the real issues that our public officials should be focused on. And we have some very serious problems in this country that require serious thought and bipartisan approaches to solving them, and that's not happening. And I think that that's, um, that's a real uh, shame that we're watching this happen. I am hoping that this gets resolved one way or another quickly so that we can get back and return to the business at hand. On the other hand, I know, having been part of the administration when an election was coming up, that the six months prior to an election, uh, generally not much happens. You know, the, the government, uh, you know, the career people basically say, we're gonna put this on hold until we see who wins the election who the new boss is going to be, if there's going to be a change in direction. So I think, unfortunately, with both the calendar and with impeachment, we're seeing a point in time where we're probably not going to see a lot of productive legislation and solutions coming out. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a favor. I'm not in favor of the way that we do transitions of administrations. Uh, having seen that uphand, it scares me almost more than anything watching 4,000 political appointees leave who know their agencies and 4,000 people eventually get in place. You know, my job, the undersecretary, which is the CEO of the healthcare system, I left that job to be secretary in February of 2017. It's a, it's a Senate confirmed position. Today, there is nobody in that job who is Senate confirmed. So you have a CEO of a, you know, $90 billion organization caring for more than 9 million veterans without a Senate confirmed person because our political process is so broken. And so uh, I don't see how that works well. Uh, but, but, you know, I'm not happy watching the impeachment process. I understand that this is um, uh, necessary to address some realistic concerns that are out there and it needs to be addressed, but I want it to be resolved quickly. Is there, uh, without, I'm not asking you to make an endorsement, but, uh, but have you heard anything uh, in the Democratic primary field about veterans issues that you find interesting, attractive? Well, you know, the field, the field is, people know if they can even remember how big the field is, is pretty diverse. You, you know, you have some, you have some people I know most of the people, not all of them, but I know some of them pretty well, particularly the senators. Um, you have some people who really 
understand the veteran issues and I'm not making endorsements, but you know, Bernie Sanders was a former chairman of the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, pretty knowledgeable involved. And then you have some others that are going to have a bigger learning curve should they should they move forward. Um, I do think that in general, um, you know, I think President Trump has made veterans a bigger issue on 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 his political sort of advocacy of his own campaign than many of the Democratic candidates have. But uh, I think that they're going to have to some of them are going to have to catch up on this pretty quickly and make sure that um, that they advocate a position that makes sense to them, that they're going to be serious about should they should they move forward, particularly to be the nominee. Thank you. All right, we're going to open up to uh, to all of you. Questions for the secretary, please. Thank you for your service. Yeah. I just want to make sure everybody heard heard the question since we don't have a microphone. So the, basically the question was, what did work in Washington? Who were some of the people who helped you? Well, first of all, and I hope this is clear in my book, um, just like what Craig had said, um, a lot of people believe this system of the Department of Veteran Affairs is too big, bureaucratic, and broken to work. And I am very clear that's just not true. It is a system that does a lot of good and it is fixable, that the reforms that I was involved in in making, I think were making this a sustainable, workable system uh, that was always going to need further improvement and refinement, but every organization does. But this organization with the right vision and the right leadership in place is a fixable, sustainable system that I believe in. Uh, secondly, um, of the, branches in government uh, and the constituents that were advocating for VA, um, there was the executive branch, there was the legislative branch, there was the veteran service organizations and veterans in general. Uh, I actually was pleasantly surprised with Congress that while I had worked with a couple people that I would call total nut jobs, I could really count them on one hand. The vast majority of Republicans and Democrats put their politics aside and really focused on what was right for veterans and voted in a bipartisan way to fix the VA. The veteran service groups, as Craig said, I felt were constructive and will, willing to address the need to change. It was the executive branch that I had the biggest challenge with. And um, it's because of that that I believe that um, the VA actually should be pulled out of this executive political environment and should become an organization that, while it's supported by taxpayer dollars, because I think that's our responsibility, should be run in a non-political environment, the way that Amtrak is and the way that the post office is, with a board that looks after what's right for veterans, that with leadership that has term leadership that isn't subject to all this political nonsense that goes on that went on with me, and that that's the right answer. And in fact, in 2016, President Obama had a bipartisan commission called the Commission on Care that made this exact recommendation. I didn't appreciate it at the time, how important it was, and President Obama was not supportive of it, so it got rejected. But I believe after watching what's happening in this administration, that's more important than ever, and we should be moving in that direction. What, what was your, I'll come back to one second. What was your sense of why President Obama did not support that recommendation? Well, I think that um, both a president and Congress never like giving up power that they have. Um, and not having experienced the downside of it, um, I don't think they appreciated how dangerous it is to watch veterans policy be thrown into political agendas the way that we're seeing today. And once you start doing that and you start having Republicans and Democrats taking positions on veteran issues, think about the implications. Do we really want people that 1% who's volunteering saying, well, only Democrats should be 
in the military or only Republicans should be in the military. I mean, the military has done such a good job of staying out of politics and out of being Republican or Democrat that I fear we're putting that at risk. Thank you. Please. Great. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll try to I'll try to do this quickly and I'll try to do it candidly. Um, when I got to VA as undersecretary, there were lots of meetings that were set up structurally for DOD and VA to meet their leadership and our leadership. And we had the meetings and we went through the agendas, but really nothing was accomplished. I mean, each side dug in and check the box that we were meeting, but there was not a real sense of true collaboration. The first time I really saw there was true intergovernmental collaboration was with the moonshot that President Obama started and then Joe Biden led on cancer. I've never seen, because frankly, the president and the vice president basically said, we're not gonna tolerate you guys keeping up your silos. And I've never seen groups begin to work together the way that I did with the cancer moonshot. And one of the greatest disappointments I had was when that didn't continue in the Trump administration, because I thought that was the best the government could do, everyone working together. I was very fortunate in the Trump cabinet that Secretary Mattis was the Secretary of Defense and John Kelly, for most of my time there, was Chief of Staff, because you had two people who totally understood what it meant to care for those that were serving. And so General Mattis, Secretary Mattis basically said, and I heard this not from him, but from his staff. He had told his staff, he said, look, if the secretary of the VA comes to you and asks for something, consider it's for me. And we began to see DOD and VA work on issues together like I had never seen before. And I was extremely optimistic. We worked together on the electronic health record, we work together on the suicide issue. We work together on improving administrative functions. And I hope that's continuing today. I just don't have the insight into that. Please, Ted. Uh, thanks for coming. So um, I'm Amy, delegate representing the Republican Party. I'm flying to <clears throat> these two very significant factors of the position. Yes. Can, can you try yeah. to yeah. repeat that? Yeah. The, question, the question was about one of the things I did was I expanded the role of the advanced practice nurse, the nurse practitioner, so they could practice independently without a physician oversight. And interestingly, this turned out to be one of the single most controversial things I did. I got 400,000 emails, letters, calls from almost every member of Congress on this issue, equally split, half for it, half against. So it was a no-win situation politically. So what I do is I make a decision based on principle. My principle was that I was trying to fix access to health care for veterans, avoid the wait time issues that had happened. So when you're doing that, the decision was frankly easy for me that we had many parts of the country, particularly rural parts of the country where veterans tend to live, where we had no doctors. And so by allowing nurse practitioners to practice independently, I was going to increase access to veterans. I made that decision. I think it's a good decision. I did not make that decision. Interestingly, I got some flack for this with, um, with the nurse anesthetists that were working well with the team of anesthesiologists and the team-based approach. We did not have access issues in anesthesia. So using the same principle, I did not grant them independent practice authority. And, um, I, I was, you know, knowing that I wasn't going to make friends, I felt comfortable with that decision. Sir. Hi, 
Um, Next. Can, I guess we sort of agree that PTSD and suicide is at the highest percentage we've ever had it in the military today? I, I, think, I think since we've been measuring it, I mean, it certainly hasn't gone down. Okay. Yeah. What I wanted to do was discuss a program I created that we're not psychologists, we're not psychiatrists, but we do help military people, especially homeless ones, get treatment for PTSD, suicide, mental health issues. Uh, I don't know how we're people are in this room, but we've done it with over a thousand animals. We foster animals for the U.S. military all over the country. We have over 600 foster homes. We double the number of foster homes because people who care about animals want to help. Right now, we have six animals in foster homes for people that will not get any yep. treatment for mental problems right. because they're not going to give up their animal because they got divorced, uh, their life fell apart. Sure. I said, the only thing I have in my life right. is this animal. So right. we've done probably Great. And times. what's your organization called? It's called PAC, P -A -C -T. We're located in Gladwin. In Gladwin? Yep. Wow. That's, that's well, it. we're all over the country Right, now. right, we right. We started right. in the Delaware Valley right. because right. I found what? out that a lot of these military people are right. saying, the only thing I got left, some were living in parks, some were living right. in garages, was this animal. And if I got to give up the animal, it's right. treatment. Well, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, uh, you know, I just have two things to say about it. If you get a chance to read the book, you'll see early on, I introduce a experience I had in Aspen, Colorado. And I like to tell people I learned medicine twice. Uh, first, when I went to medical school 100 years ago. Uh, and secondly, when I went to Aspen, Colorado with uh, disabled veterans who many were in the condition you're talking about, suffering from invisible wounds and PTSD. And there, most of them had these service animals, these dogs. And they explained to me that before they got their dogs, they were on all sorts of medications, making them sick and not feeling any better and getting all sorts of in and out of programs. And then they got these animals and it changed their lives. And so that's the, I, I, I couldn't agree more with the experience that you've had. VA had a program and this is part of what I was saying about VA's approach. VA will not pay for service dogs. Um, and the reason is because there's not evidence to show that they work, even yeah, though- A lot of these are not service dogs. In some way, it's I, email. I understand. I understand. I understand. But service dogs and, and, and I understand what you're doing are even trained at a different level. So VA's position is unless there's evidence, scientific evidence, it won't change its policy to pay for it. So VA started a study, a $25 million study over 10 years to show whether service dogs have an impact. Now, I heard about this and I said, I want to hear more about the study. It turned out, as many of you who know research, there are two arms. There's the arm that's testing the intervention with the service dog and then the arm that isn't, usually a placebo. But they couldn't get any veteran to agree not to take the dog. <laughs> so they went with one arm in the study. And I said, so you're spending $25 million studying veterans that all have dogs to see if they have an impact. This has got to be the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so I started just making the benefit available. And, and I believe strongly that, uh, and and we actually had a, had a benefit starting along the lines that you are. Lara Trump, who is you know, married to one of the sons, uh, is very, very interested in this issue. And we went to the Humane Society and said, instead of killing dogs, why not make them available to veterans? And that's something that I hope continues. See what it, we don't charge. So yeah. We, but, we don't charge yeah. Any. We're going to go to the back. This gentleman's been waiting patiently. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, I, I, I should just say that, you know, I came in with certain biases thinking that you're going to find that, um, you know, VA government workers are nine to five people, don't work that hard, don't, you know, you know, are there because they couldn't find jobs in other places. But in fact, it was 
uh, very impressive. The people working there, very dedicated, very mission focused. Many of them veterans themselves wanting to give back. And I, I am eternally grateful to the people who work in the VA system. Please, yes. Hi, my name is Anella. Um, I have had an opportunity to read some of your books. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I will say that my experience of burying my father mm. is one of the best yeah. experiences that yeah. I had that generation did. Yeah. Um, having read your book and also, um, by the way, I do do some services and research. I've done any action as well for the government. Having read your book and also reading Think and Media about the different decisions that were made during your tenure as the VA secretary, your book does talk about Right, 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 right. Um, one hundred percent. These were decisions that I owned. That were, you know, I think everybody in a leadership position. When I ran hospitals, you always get input from your stakeholders, from patients, from board members, from doctors, from nurses, uh, from people in your community to make sure you're servicing needs. So there's a confusion about when you get advice or people are coming to give you their perspective, but owning that decision and making sure that I believe that they were consistent with the reason I was there, which is to make this system work better for veterans. Those were always my decisions. Uh, and as I said, even if the president asked me to do something I didn't believe in, I wasn't going to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Please. <laughs> yeah. Gridlock that we have in Washington D.C. Uh, we looked at the House, for example, it has over 100 bills that are now sitting in the in the cemetery at the, in, in the Senate. And what can we do to, to break that log jam and to bring bring people together to focus uh, on their mutual interests uh, of getting getting things done for the country? Yeah, I, I wish, I wish I had a had an easy answer for you. Um, you know, and you know, all that I can say is is that it's very important that all of us vote in this election. Uh, that it's important that we send a message that we're not willing to tolerate this anymore, um, and that the people that go there should have a mandate of what people are sending them there for. And I do think that it's going to require leadership at the top of government to be able to say that the job needs to be to be able to get work done and to solve problems and not win political arguments. And so it's clearly not working now. And if we uh, as a country continue to keep the same people in place, whether they're, you know, pick, pick the level that you're voting for, um, then we're probably going to end up with this type of government again. Yeah, um, and and I do I do write about this in the book. Um, the people the people that I think were working against what I was doing directly against um, the policies that I was putting in place were actually political appointees from the Trump administration. 
these three individuals that you're talking about, I understand that makes a nice, sexy media story, but these are individuals that uh, knew the president beforehand, had uh, a, an arrangement with the president to be able to offer advice because they wanted to see the VA fixed. Uh, I took their advice as individual citizens the way that I did with literally hundreds of other individual citizens, uh, hospital CEOs, people in industry who would reach out and say, we have ideas just like this gentleman here, you know, that can help veterans. And I thought my job was to be open to hearing those ideas and taking help from people that wanted to help. But in no way did outside people who weren't in government uh, inappropriately influenced my decision because I had a clear boundary that while I take advice, just like the question before, these were decisions that were appropriate for somebody who was confirmed by the Senate and worked for the president and not decisions to be made by private individuals. Okay. We, we have time for one more and you got it. <laughs> Yep. I am a formerly registered Republican, but you've got to run the country. And that's what I was saying to you earlier. Yep. Is thank you for the country that you are. You will be nothing. Thank you for your service in Vietnam. You are nothing if you are not a people's champion. And you've just got that's on both sides. This is not sound to Mr. Trump. So if you had a nudge, yep. a nudge here, what could you have been able to do? Not just vote. Yeah. Vote. So yeah. Yeah, look, um, you know, I try hard, and I think you're representing this point of view. Um, no matter what my political beliefs are, I tried very hard not to bring that into government. I didn't think that was the job. And when I left, when I was fired, uh, a number of senators from both sides, Democrats and Republicans, held a reception for me. And Senator Tester, who's from Montana, a Democrat, stood up at the reception and said, you know, I've worked with David for three years. And I couldn't tell you today if he's a Republican or Democrat. And I said, perfect. That's exactly what it should be. Uh, watching what's happening now in Washington and the reason why I describe in such detail what happened to me in my book is because what happened to me 18 months ago is exactly what I'm watching happening right now on TV. And I am very proud of those public servants, some of them political appointees, but many career, who are standing up and saying, this is what I believe in, this is why I came to this job, and I'm gonna speak out. And some of them clearly, I can tell you, are putting themselves at personal risk. We got a lot of threats, we got a lot of people who dropped off uh, threatening letters to us at our home. Um, this is a very divided country. Uh, and so I think the answer to your question is, is that if you're an American, particularly those that have served, it's important that you stand up and you speak your beliefs, no matter what the belief is, that, that was, that's what makes us American is our willingness to stand up and say when you think things are wrong and speak out. And frankly, there's one disappointment that I have, it's the silence that so many of our elected officials have, no matter, no matter what their position, but staying silent at a time like this, I just don't understand it, so. Mr. Secretary, thank you, I wanna thank all of you. And now you have an opportunity to get the book. Right. <laughs>